stop scrolling. Today, we're taking the Liberty Engine 5.0 into the real world. In our last video, we showed a generator that seemed to keep itself running while feeding power to a load, and the backlash was instant. People said it breaks thermodynamics, that it must be a trick, or that we measured wrong. So we're doing the test everyone asked for, an outdoor off-grid run with instruments and raw readings. No wall outlets, no hidden lines, no vague claims, just a machine, open air, and numbers on screen. If it dies, you'll watch it. If it holds, you'll watch it. What we built and why people don't buy it. Before we touch the meter, let's name the problem. A device that claims to produce more energy than it consumes is called overunity, and most engineers reject it on sight. That's not because they are closed-minded, it's because almost every such claim collapses under careful testing. Still, we built the Liberty Engine 5.0 to put a specific idea on trial. The prototype is a modified electric generator and electric motor connected by a drive belt. In the simplest description, the generator makes electricity, the motor uses some of that electricity, and the belt transfers the motor's motion back to the generator. People hear that and say, that's a loop, it will slow down. They are right to be skeptical. A loop is not a proof. Measurements are the proof, so this video is not a promise. It's a test. We also know the criticism about hidden power. That's why we leave the workshop and go somewhere with no external supply. And yes, we will include the scientific papers we mention in the description, so you can check what is established science and what is still debated. If you're here hoping for magic, you may be disappointed. If you're here hoping for clean data, you're in the right place. The outdoor run, no wall power, no excuses. We drive out to a rural area where there are no outlets to blame and no grid connection to hide behind. The whole point is to remove the easiest cheating paths. We set the unit on a surface and keep the camera rolling. The system has two outlet switches on its frame and we treat them like a clear start and stop line. To begin, we give the belt and shaft an initial spin using a battery-powered drill. That's to overcome inertia and get the rotation started. Once the rotor is moving, the generator produces a voltage at the outlets. One of those outlets feeds the electric motor. As the motor wakes up, it adds torque back through the belt, pushing the generator again. That is the self-feeding loop everyone argues about. During the run, we track voltage and current, and we watch how they change when we add a load and when we remove it. We also keep an eye on heat, sound, and mechanical behavior, because the system can look stable while it quietly bleeds energy as friction and heat. And at the end, we do the simplest control. We flip the switch, cut the motor's power path, and see if the motion collapses the way ordinary physics predicts. If it stops quickly, that tells one story. If it doesn't, that tells a different story. Either way, the test is the story. Why the textbooks expect it to slow down? Let's be fair to the critics, because their argument is strong. In a normal generator, changing magnetic flux induces current. That current creates its own magnetic field, and the interaction produces a resisting force on the rotor. That back reaction is tied to Lenz's law. In plain terms, when you pull electrical power out, the shaft feels like it's being held back. Moreover, real machines waste energy in many small ways. Copper windings heat up from a resistance, iron cores suffer hysteresis and eddy losses. Bearings create drag, belts slip, and air turns into a brake at higher speeds. The load and braking action are usually increased. This is why a motor generator loop is normally a trap. The motor does not get free energy from the generator. It only gets a portion of the mechanical work you already put in, minus losses. So the loop decays. That is the baseline expectation, and you should keep it in your head while watching the meters. If the Liberty engine appears to run indefinitely while powering something measurable, then either the measurements are wrong, there is an unseen energy input, or there is a physical effect at work that the simple model did not include. Those are the only honest options. The rest is storytelling. The rotor material claim, explained simply, this is where our build tries to separate itself from every other perpetual generator video online. 
The rotor is described as a special composite, not a conventional metal disc. The claim is that it behaves like a high temperature topological quantum superconductor. It is described as a rare earth doped cuprate structure combined with layers of bilayer graphene twisted near the so-called magic angle around 1.1 degrees along with other ingredients we discussed previously. The reason this matters is coherence. In some superconducting states, electrical resistance drops towards zero and magnetic fields can be expelled or pinned in unusual ways. Supporters argue that when neodymium magnets rotate past this rotor, you don't get the usual eddy or Foucault currents that turn motion into heat because there is no normal resistive pathway. They also argue you don't get the usual magnetic breaking because the magnetic flux becomes trapped in stable quantum states, more like a patterned memory than a swirling, lossy current. In that picture, the coupling can become far less dissipative. At the same time, Faraday's law still says a changing flux can produce a voltage in the generator's coils. So the bold claim is voltage output remains while resistive torque drops below what standard materials would produce. To be clear, superconductivity does not automatically mean free energy. It means lower losses. That's why this section is a claim, not a conclusion. If the rotor truly measurably reduces braking torque, the data should show it. Less heatings on cord C, less drag, and a different relationship between load and slowdown than a normal machine from low losses to vacuum energy, the big leap. After the rotor argument, the narrative makes a much bigger leap. It says the system is not only low loss, but also open to an external reservoir. The proposed reservoir is the electromagnetic vacuum, sometimes described as zero point fluctuations in quantum electrodynamics. According to the claim, the machine does not break the first law because it does not create energy. Instead, it extracts energy from fluctuations, using coherence and asymmetry to turn tiny random motion into usable work. The second law is addressed by saying the system is not closed, so entropy can be exported while work is extracted. To support that story, people point to real quantum effects that are not science fiction. The Josephson effect shows that superconducting pairs can flow with no voltage drop under certain conditions. Quantum pumping ideas show that, in nanoscale systems, you can produce a directed current through periodic modulation. And the dynamical Casimir effect, tied to Schwinger 1992 and Chalmers 2011 experiments, is cited as vacuum fluctuations turning into real photons. Some enthusiasts cite Scoville's 1959 thermal quantum motor, a 2022 lab demo at the University of Mines, and other quantum pumping devices. Here is the honest boundary line. These phenomena exist, but scaling them into a belt-driven generator that powers macroscopic loads is an extraordinary claim. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary controls, independent replication, and full power audits. So in this video, we treat the vacuum energy explanation as a hypothesis, not a victory lap. The meters and the controls come first. The theory comes second. Legends, allegations, and the only thing that matters. Whenever a device hints at free energy or prohibited tech, history rushes in. Nikola Tesla is invoked, especially his 1901 language about drawing power from the environment. People claim his papers were seized after his death. Thomas Henry Moray is mentioned for demonstrations of off-grid lighting, along with stories of sabotage. Stanley Meyer is brought up for water fuel claims and the fact that he died in 1998, which some treat as proof of suppression. Some of those stories may hold the truth, some may be myths, but none of them prove that our machine works. History is not evidence, data is evidence. So we do two things at once. First, we show what the system does in real time, outside with no external supply. Second, we show how it stops. When we flip the switch and the motor no longer receives power from the outlets, the loop should collapse. If it collapses cleanly, that supports the conventional view. If it behaves unexpectedly, that opens the door to deeper testing. Either way, we invite independent verification. No comments, not rumors, verification. And a final warning, 
our prototypes are not for sale. If you see Liberty Engine units being sold on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, don't buy them. Those sellers are not affiliated with us. If you want to support the channel, like, subscribe, and share the video so qualified eyes can critique the measurements. Thanks for watching this field test. If you're convinced, don't stop at belief. Push for replication. If you're unconvinced, don't stop at insults. Push for better controls. In the next video, we'll tighten the measurements, add stricter load tests, and invite outside reviewers where possible. Until then, remember this, science doesn't fear questions, but it demands honesty. Watch the readings, notice the start conditions, notice the shutdown, and please ignore anyone selling our device online. They're scammers. Share this with someone who can analyze it calmly, and we'll see you next time. Your skepticism is welcome here, but so is your curiosity.